very fortunate today to have Reb Greg presenting on legal liability issues in their education. If you don't know Reb, one, I'm a little surprised. Uh, Reb is active in our, in our circles, very involved with, with ACCT, AEE, Wilderness Risk Managers Conference, uh, Knowles, Outward Bound, Student Conservation Association, you name it, Reb has, has really dug deep with us in outdoor and adventure education for the past couple of decades. What's really cool is he is also a lawyer. He's also been president of the, uh, the Houston Bar Association, and served on the board of directors for the State Bar of Texas. So it's pretty rare to have someone with expertise in both those sides and who really understands who we are uh, and what it is we're trying to do out there. So Rev, we're really excited to have you here today. Uh, and I'll go ahead and pass it on over to you. Thanks, Dan. Um, welcome, it's a little, cloudy here in Houston and my office uh, is on a window and so I have sort of a ghostly visage uh, at least as I see myself those of you who know me I don't want you to think I've suddenly taken a turn for the worse it's the lighting um, again welcome and I thank Angie and Steve for the work they did in the last two weeks in helping us understand the management and the measurement and the memorializing of risk and risk management issues. Our discussion today is where risk and law, I'm tempted to say collide, but that's not fair. It's really where law and risk recognize each other. Uh, this image on the lower left side of my screen is me. I do know some of you guys. Uh, I'm listening to a question or a comment, and as Dan said, we'll have an opportunity for doing that toward the end of the hour. Uh, the first slide in here is the disclaimer, uh, which you've seen, I think, in other presentations by other lawyers. Please read it and just take it seriously. I'm not going to read it to you. Okay, understanding risk. Uh, what a wonderful word it is. Uh, again, those of you who know me know that I like to play around with words, and this, this is a good one. Uh, it's a possibility of harm or loss. So there is a cautionary tone to it. Um, but that's not all it is. Uh, as I dug deeper into the etymology of the word, I ran across the Italian resicari, to dare. And then I scratched a little deeper and there was another meaning given, to run into danger. Now, I think it was run into, I-N-T-O, not run, I-N, space, T-O. And I'm sorry for putting such a fine point on it. But uh, I find in this, to dare, to run into danger, a, uh, uh, a strong suggestion of intentionality. And that relates, I think, very much to our programs. Uh, a fellow named Peter Bernstein has written a marvelous book called Against the Gods. I'm sorry, Against the Odds. And it's a takeoff on the concept of operating against the gods, uh, relating back to a time when people thought bad things that happened because the gods wanted them to. So Against the Odds, Bernstein's book, is the history of our learning how to measure risk. And there are just some wonderful jewels in there. I, I know some of you have read it. It's a long read, but it's worth getting it just for pieces. Uh, you, some of you have heard me quote John Bowlby, died a couple of years ago, child development specialist, a Brit. And he said, a life well managed is a series of daring adventures from a solid base. I always love that. And then within the last couple of years, I don't remember the author, but I saw a piece on the new three R's in children's education. And they are, we risk too little, we rescue too soon, and we rave too much. Isn't that good stuff? We risk too little, rescue too soon, and rave too much. Kids quoted in there saying that he was 24 years old before he realized he wasn't awesome. Um, as I say here, and as well known to you guys, uh, we look for risk. Uh, it sharpens the experiences for both faculty and students. We continue to do this in spite of some losses that we know have been suffered because the risks uh, don't measure up to the benefits. The benefits, in our mind, this is what keeps us going, 
to our students outweigh those risks. But we manage the risks. We're not in the business of doing away with it. So maybe the world's shortest risk management plan uh, in this next panel, uh, having determined that what you are doing is aligned with your mission and that you know it is, um, you ask yourself, what can go wrong here? And second, having identified what can go wrong in some reasonable range of probability, how do you reduce the chances of those things going wrong? This is where Angie gave us so much help. Um, and Steve picked up talking about maintaining records, uh, getting educated when you can, uh, establishing metrics for recording and memorializing uh, what has gone wrong. And then finally that leads us to the last, and they what do us wrong? Now being in the adventure business, I'm gonna go out on the limb and say this, if we do adventure right, they're going to be surprises. And so uh, we identify where can bad things happen. And in what I do, uh, this is the area where legal liability is most likely to pop up. It is, again, the first silo uh, in a risk management scheme. Okay. <clears throat> again, I describe two different silos of uh, risk management. One, you're taking care of your students. The second silo, you're taking care of your program. First silo represents the most intimate relationship with the students. The second is what you're doing back home to prepare for that. This is the first silo, where the bad things can happen. And I'm not going to read all these to you, and this is not intended to be exhaustive. Uh, but, I mean, as an example, the exchange of information is where you tell the student what you think the student needs to know about what you're going to do so that the student can decide this issue of suitability. You also collect from the student what you need to know about the student so that it can be a reasonably successful venture for the student. Those are things that ought to be taking place before your interaction with the student. When the event take place, takes place, when the bad thing actually happens, issues immediately pop up of supervision. Uh, how you respond to the emergency. Some of you have heard me say that in my experience, I think insurance companies will support me on this, more bad stuff comes out of the way you respond to the emergency than comes out of the emergency itself. People have a pretty good level of tolerance for uh, understanding that bad things can happen. What they will not tolerate is sloppiness or dishonesty afterwards. So we are really vulnerable in the way we respond to the emergency. Record keeping, whatever log you've been maintaining at the end of each day or as events occur uh, will be enhanced, obviously, by a description of bad events. Maybe you get witness statements. Uh, maybe your instructors make entries, uh, <coughs> hopefully avoiding judgments about why things happen, but focusing instead on what happened. And then finally, all this is over after this is over, uh, what lessons have been learned? How do you generate a corporate memory? And how do you spread that through the organization of what you have learned from this event? Uh, and again, records, changes in policy. Now, as Steve pointed out, there's some hazards in this business of record keeping. And I've been on panels where I argue with people about the importance to having a good program of maintaining good records that tell you where you screwed up. Uh, you know, ideally, you would have a sufficient uh, culture of, of uh, risk management so that people can talk among themselves and to supervisors about what they and others might have done wrong. So that you're developing this wonderful inventory, this great reservoir of learning. But you gotta act on it. Because the worst thing can happen to you in a lawsuit is for a lawyer to ask you on the stand, uh, Mr. Gregg, didn't the same thing happen two months ago? 
uh, in Idaho? And you have to say yes. And I, I'm asked, did you change anything? Well, we haven't gotten around to it. So understand that the records you keep of the events themselves and the way you write them up and your reaction to those things all are going to get into play um, when and if there's a lawsuit. All right, let's go to silo two now. And this is things that you do back at the shop in preparing for these bad things. And these are all pretty well self-explanatory. Um, I'll let you read through these. You now it's occurred to me recently among the wise use of professionals, uh, kids seem to be changing so that I just wonder if kind of bending the ear for a half a day of some child development specialist that can help us understand where kids are now today. Things we used to take for granted about a 14 year old kid maybe just don't pertain any longer. But this last point, being aware of applicable laws and what other folks are doing, if you're not doing something the way other people in the industry are doing, if you come back the, from the Wilderness Risk Managers Conference and you find that you're a minority of one in the way you cross a river, let's say, uh, you better have a very good reason for doing it the way you're doing. Be prepared to defend it when some expert throws it in front of you in a courtroom and saying, uh, here are 15 named programs, Mr. Gregg, that do this entirely differently. Can you explain why you're the 16th and you're not? All right. Understanding legal. Um, there is a television advertisement uh, on a Houston station now uh, that is an image of a woman walking out of a law office, and she is saying, uh, Greg and Greg, is, they are more than lawyers. They're human beings. That kind of makes me wonder how people view lawyers if not as human beings, but it does allow me to make this point that the law, uh, in what some might regard as a rather severe, cold, impersonal way, is about creating predictability. It's about making things work. It's, it's not about what's ethical. It's not about what's fair. It's not about what getting what you deserve. It's not following any particular theology. It's what the heck is going to make this community hum. So if you understand that, uh, it'll help you understand some of the stuff that's going to follow, which might not quite fit your personal view of what's even right and wrong. Uh, I remember a story that uh, Ernest Hemingway was, in, was confronted uh, somewhere in Africa and he was challenged about his practice of elephant hunting. And this woman said, Mr. Hemingway, isn't that against the law? He says, it's, oh, it's much more marvelous than that. It's a sin. <laughs> well, we're not talking about sins. Uh, we're talking about breaking the law. And, and I want to be careful about this, but if you're running a good program, I would say that the issue of uh, being in compliance and meeting certain obligations of the law really ought to be about halfway down your list of things to worry about. If you've got a good program, um, you're going to pretty much run right with the law. And uh, my definition of a good program is one that keeps its promises, does what it says it's going to do, and it takes care of its participants. So, understanding legal, part two. Um, Bad things happen to us, uh, even to the very best programs. So uh, whether we think we're desperately in the need of a battery of lawyers to support us or have to go out and buy a coat and tie because we may be going to court, uh, you need to understand issues of legal liability. And uh, what we're going to talk about today is at the very core uh, of your operation and is a principal issue in terms of your legal liability, and that is what duty of care do you owe to your participants? Now, there are many areas of exposure. I mean, government regulations of various types, uh, contract law, that is, promises that are broken, uh, a variety of legal issues that are facing you. We are talking about your legal duty of care. So why does duty matter? Uh, well, I'm going to go moralistic on you for a bit and just remind you that uh, we're taught that it is good to take, it's good to take care of folks. I love thy neighbor. But more importantly, and certainly more pertinent to our discussion now, if you fail to meet your legal duty of care, 
uh, you're going to find yourself launched into a lawsuit involving negligence. One's legal duty of care is the heart and soul of a claim of negligence. <coughs> Sorry for the coughing. You all have seen this, I know, but I want to just remind us about the elements of negligence. Uh, a good definition of negligence is that it is unreasonable carelessness. Unreasonable carelessness. Uh, the elements of a claim of negligence, if it's asserted in a courtroom, are these. A legal duty of care is owed. Uh, that duty is breached. In other words, it is not met. And the breach of the duty causes a loss. Now, just backing up a bit, negligence is carelessness only. It is not recklessness. There's a difference. Carelessness does not measure a state of mind. It is simply about conduct. For recklessness, a court can be told or shown that you acted as though you just didn't care. You were indifferent to the results of what you were doing. It wasn't that you just weren't thinking about hitting that car at the intersection. Uh, for recklessness, uh, you were affirmatively uh, unconcerned about the possibility that that might happen. And you know, carelessness is not about intentional behavior. So it is that niche of conduct in the law that we examine, which has to do with simply carelessness. Uh, the loss caused by that breach, the test that we sometimes learn in law school is the but-for test. In other words, but-for the alleged negligence, this loss would not have occurred. So there has to be that connection between what you did that was negligent and uh, the loss that occurred. And we're going to talk about a case or two in which there was not that connection. There has to be a reasonable and foreseeable result for there to be a successful claim. All right. Uh, I'm going to take a chance. This is a little subtle, but I think it's important. There are several levels of inquiry when we talk about legal duty of care. First and foremost, the issue of whether or not a duty of care is owed is for a judge to decide. The jury never gets to the issue of whether or not a duty of care was owed. The jury deals with the issue of whether or not there was a breach. But a judge decides from the outset, maybe even before you get to trial, whether or not the relationship was such here that a duty of care was owed. Now, what I'm gonna give you for the first level is just this sort of universal duty of care that is owed to the world. Uh, whether you're moving about uh, in a gym or in the woods or in a, walking down a hall with a cup of coffee, um, the duty of care generally that you owe, the universal duty of care, is to behave in a way that doesn't expose other people to unreasonable danger. Again, that unreasonable business. Behave in a way that does not expose others to an unreasonable danger. We talked about loving your neighbor here. We're saying, don't hurt your neighbor. But now we go to the next level. Who is your neighbor? As I say, we are not liable for every goofy thing that we do. And so we're going to look at the next level, moving from this universal test. Was a duty of care of some sort owed to this plaintiff, I call him, because I've got us now in a lawsuit. We know there is this universal care of not causing harm to somebody. How do I know whether or not this particular person that is suing me um, was owed a duty of care? Out of all these people in the universe that I might have owed a duty to, how do I know whether or not I owe a duty to this particular person? And the test there is the uh, question of whether or not the relationship with this person the relationship with this person was such that the person might suffer harm if you act or don't act in a certain way. Now, I hope I'm making this, this issue clear. There is a certain intimacy. There is at least a connection. Uh, there is a relationship 
for you to have a duty to a particular person in a particular circumstance. So uh, relationship is one test. The second is foreseeability. Foreseeability has to do with the likelihood or the ability to anticipate that some bad thing is going to happen. Uh, one of the earliest cases we learn about in law is the Paul's graph case, something that happened in 1928. And a guy was running to get on an airplane. We can back up one, I think, Dan. A guy was running to get on a train, and he had a bunch of packages, and the uh, crew of the train was helping him on the train, and some of the packages dropped. And there were explosives in the boxes, I guess, fire, I don't know. Um, but anyway, there was an explosion, and it was severe enough to cause a set of scales, things used for weighing heavy objects, a set of scales to collapse, and they fell on somebody. The issue was whether or not the train, in its carelessness of allowing these packages to be dropped, were responsible for the loss suffered by this poor soul that the uh, scales fell on. The court said no. The court said the actors, that is the people helping the guy with the boxes, could not have anticipated that a result of their not doing that well might cause A, an explosion, secondly, the toppling of the scales, and third, the injury at the other end of all this. Um, a case that Knowles, uh, and I see a number of them are on this, good to see you guys, or here you almost see it. Uh, a student was shot by a turkey hunter in a national park. And I don't know that the issue of foreseeability was raised, but I think that might have been a fair question for somebody to ask. Uh, could Knowles, as persons leading others through a national park, uh, have a uh, reason to believe that that person might be shot by a turkey? Uh, you know, the answer might be no. I didn't know uh, until this case came up that there was generally hunting allowed in the national park system. The Munn case, Munn v. Hotchkiss, I bet you all know that case. It's the Hotchkiss School, and they took a class to China, and one of the children was bitten by a tick and uh, suffered from, suffered encephalitis and was terribly immobilized and still is greatly incapacitated and the jury awarded uh, this young woman and her family $41 million. The issue came up whether or not Hodgkiss reasonably should have been able to foresee that this kind of a tick bearing encephalitis was going to be encountered. The jury found that the school should have foreseen that based on some data, but this was hotly contested at trial. Um, but the basis of the claim that Knowles should have known this and protected the students from it, uh, and, and then uh, assisted them through it, uh, was based upon a finding that the school should have known this kind of thing could happen. In fact, the way the jury question read was, uh, should they have known of the danger of disease-bearing insects, foreseeability? Uh, I'm going to show you a quote in a moment from the T-Day case. It's only a couple of months old. It involved a plane crash, skydiving. Uh, one of the uh, divers, it turned out to be one of the more experienced divers, uh, when the door to the plane uh, flew off in flight, unbuckled his seatbelt and tried to pull the door back in. The pilot was disturbed enough by that after complaining a number of times to this one diver, uh, that he leaned back from the controls and tried to catch the belt of this fella and pull him back into his seat. And in doing that, uh, he lost control and the plane crashed. Uh, the pilot was killed. The lawsuit had to do with the uh, quality of the training that the pilot and all the passengers got on the ground. And the court threw it out and said a trainer uh, could not reasonably have anticipated this change of circumstances that resulted in this death. 
foreseeability. Here's the language from the Teed case. Okay. Now, we're in the courtroom. Uh, we have the plaintiff who is bringing the lawsuit, the person who alleged to have suffered some loss. We have the defendant, the person who was accused of having done something wrong. Um, what are the factors that the judge must consider in deciding the nature of the duty? Not whether a duty, because we've already decided that. The nature of the duty that is owed by the defendant to this plaintiff. The first, we've already talked a bit about this. We talked generally about the relationships having to be of a certain type, but there are specific types of relationships that uh, greatly influence duty of care. Student and instructor, uh, adult and minor, um, an expert and a beginner. Wonderful case out of Texas A&M, just up the road. Uh, the um, counselors uh, from an upper class invited some freshmen to go on a adventure. And you won't believe this. The adventure was hiking to a railroad trestle, lying upside down on the trestle under the tracks as the train went over the tracks. Uh, nobody was hurt during that nutty uh, part of the adventure, but a young woman hurt her ankle when she was climbing back down uh, from the trestle. Well, the issue was whose responsibility was this? Was it a Texas A&M adventure? Uh, was it simply what we call in the law uh, a, a bunch of people out together, no particular leader, nobody dictating who is going to do what, uh, just a, a bunch of people, friends perhaps, uh, not under any particular authority with no particular uh, direction being provided by anybody. So the issue came up, was the relationship among these people such that any one or more of those people could be held liable for uh, this uh, twisted or broken ankle. And the court didn't answer that, but the court said, we want to hear more uh, on that particular issue. This is not the kind of case we're going to let go before trial. We want there to be a trial, and part of that trial has got to be what was the relationship between uh, these uh, people who were participating in this sort of joint enterprise. When it was heard again, they determined that there was enough uh, control, enough authority assumed by the upperclassmen so that they were responsible. Important for us, and we'll dwell on this further, there are certain relationships of control and trust, custodial relationships slash control, fiduciary relationships slash trust or faith, um, that enlarge the duty of Care. The duty of care is enlarged from simply not causing harm to protecting those persons from harm. And that, of course, is us. I mean, the people that we serve, there may be circumstances during the course of a relationship where this isn't true, but by and large, uh, we have a significant enough degree of control over these people, and they have allowed a certain uh, amount of trust and faith in us to exist. Sometimes we've created that. Uh, so that we have a duty not only not to harm them, but to protect them from harm coming from other agencies. Another factor uh, in duty is the nature of the activity. Sports and recreation, we'll see in a few minutes, has its own kind of set of duties of care. And they are, and it's getting better, frankly, they are more relaxed than a duty of care that might be owed in another kind of activity. And the, the rationale for that is that you want vigorous participation. And you can't have vigorous participation without the possibility of some kind of inadvertent harm. Instruction, uh, 
a person who is instructing another is intentionally pushing the envelope, and that, of course, can uh, lead to some exposures that might not otherwise exist. Essential services, uh, significant, because services in some cases are deemed so essential that you can't even, by agreement, relieve another person of their duty of care. We set up expectations of care and, and frame a duty in some way, promises we make, things that we say at the website, uh, even things that might be said in the field, uh, things that set up an obligation, again, an expectation that this person will take care of me and therefore, and then laws and standards and prevailing practices. I mentioned prevailing practices earlier. Uh, laws, if there is a violation of a law, uh, in the commission of this breach, uh, you will be deemed guilty of negligence per se. That is, the negligence part of this is out of the way. If you have violated a law that was designed to prevent the very thing that you did, and you do break that law, uh, you are found to have been negligent per se, and that all that remains to decide is whether or not your negligence caused the loss. It's a little different with standards and prevailing practices. Experts come in talking about standards and about prevailing practices, and uh, their testimony is taken, if true, as simply some evidence of negligence. So the distinction is between laws, negligence per se, and standards and prevailing practices, which come into court simply as some evidence of negligence, which can be contradicted by other experts. And then finally, five, and um, I just lumped all these in together. I'll let you, let you read them. This bottom, I think, is important, and, and even the best writers in this area finally conclude their uh, textbook discussions of duty by saying, look, bottom line, uh, duty is whatever the jury finally, uh, having been instructed by the judge, uh, says it is. Uh, basically, it's the jury, it is the community uh, in the uh, persons of the jury saying, hey, this community thinks this person deserves uh, to be protected. The standard of conduct, uh, having determined that a duty of care existed, including a specific duty of care under these circumstances, by virtue of relationships or whatever, how will this person's conduct be judged? And here it is, it's this reasonable person test that I know you've all heard. Uh, did the defendant act as a reasonable person would have, or organization, under the same or similar circumstances? And the circumstances we're talking about is this bundle of things we've been talking before. You know, differentiations in the um, competencies or learning, uh, age, whatever. What would a reasonable person have done? Two things, the objectivity of this test, there is no reasonable person, it's this fictitious out there, and we're asking the jury to posit what would a reasonable person have done under these circumstances. Um, I, you know, I could talk an hour about how reasonable we are not, and so I am concerned, particularly in emergent situations, so I am a little concerned about uh, this passion we have for this reasonableness test, but it's there. Um, the other thing about the test is it's talking about uh, just what it says, what is reasonable under the circumstances, not perfection, not best practices, what is reasonable. So you can be reasonably wrong. You can make a choice which in retrospect is determined by a jury to have been not reasonable. Oh, but the same jury can say that the choice you made was reasonable, even though it might have caused some harm. So again, the test is reasonable, it's not being absolutely right. All right, how do you reduce the duty of care? Well, we have disclaimers and we have warnings uh, in our participant agreement and in our uh, documentation, stuff we stay at the website, stuff we may say in other publications to the students. We warn them about things that can happen. We talk about things that we are not responsible for. We talk about things for whom, about whose responsibility is somebody else's 
If you're using some kind of a contractor on your course, you want to be sure that your students understand that bad things that happen out of what that contractor does is between the students and that contractor, and you're not a part of that picture, but you have to be explicit about that. Uh, releases and waivers, um, sometimes those are incorporated too into a participant agreement, uh, which decorates this uh, culpability feature with a lot of information about what is going to happen out there and um, again how these people can get hurt. So releases and waivers, assumption of risk, and the inherency of the loss causing risk. Assumption of risk uh, is in two types. You can have an expressed assumption of a risk and you can have an implied assumption of risk. Expressed assumption is where you say, uh, I choose not to wear a helmet, uh, or I choose to drive with this drunk, even though I know my chances of getting hurt uh, are great. Or you can have an implied assumption of risk, where simply by virtue of diving in and participating in what is known to be a risky venture, you are deemed to have assumed uh, the possibility of being hurt in that venture. Now, this is a little tough. The expressed assumption of risk, which is usually going to be incorporated in your participant agreement, um, gives you an absolute defense to a claim. If instead the assumption of risk is implied simply by virtue of your participating in an activity with an awareness of its risks, then the judge and jury will engage in comparing your fault in making that choice with the bad acts of the uh, of the service provider. Inherency of the loss causing risk. Again, we're talking about ways to reduce the risk, reduce the duty of care. Inherency uh, is a characteristic which is so much a part of the activity that if you took it out of the activity, it would be a different activity. Falling out of a raft, falling off of a horse, tripping on a trail. The law does not allow you to increase the inherent risks, but it forgives you for losses that come out of an inherent risk. You have no legal responsibility to protect a participant from an inherent risk and no liability if one occurs. Good example comes out of rafting, a couple of cases. Uh, one, <coughs> a person jostled drop, around the raft and hit the steel framing of the raft and was hurt pretty badly. Judge said that's just an inherent risk of rafting. The raft needs those supports. Um, it just comes with the territory. In another case, though, the rafting outfitter uh, put two children on the raft at the feet of the parents who were sitting in the front row of the raft. Of course, the raft hit some tough water, a lot of turbulence. One of the children bump, uh, was bumped up, hit the under part of the mother's jaw, and uh, severely damaged her jaw. The court said that is not an inherent risk of rafting. That is a mistake in the way these passengers were placed uh, in the raft. I got a call one time at a meeting saying that a client who was running a course in the Amazon had had a client uh, arm bitten off by a crocodile. Well, as we peel this back, what happened? The guy had bribed one of the, um, one of the staff members to find a crocodile that this guy uh, I'm sure you'd have an adult beverage or two, could wrestle with. Uh, clearly, having your arm bitten off by a crocodile is not an inherent risk of a river trip on the Avalon. A lot of climbing cases, uh, including some cases in which uh, it was shown that the setting of protection was negligence, uh, in which the fall was deemed simply an inherent risk of climbing. Bad things happen climbing. One of the reasons people climb is the exhilaration of not falling. Uh, which is going to get us to our next category, next slide, which has to do uh, with public policy. It is an argument, it is an analysis that courts will make uh, if they find that imposing a duty on somebody in a given situation basically shocks the conscience. Uh, as I say here, the language is something like this, that the interests of society will be best served by relaxing the duty of care that would ordinarily be owed. 
In the Hotchkiss case, it is on appeal, a partial appeal of a point. The, uh, the uh, federal court in Connecticut has asked the Connecticut state court to tell them uh, or to enlighten them as to the public policy of the state of Connecticut on this issue. Is college travel abroad, including cultural exchanges, of such value that a school offering that should not be held to the duty of care that this school Hotchkiss was in this case. In other words, the continuation and the integrity and the freedom to vigorously offer these programs uh, is more important to the welfare of society than to protect a student from the kind of loss uh, that was suffered in the Hotchkiss case. This is a floating uh, concept. It sort of is there to clean up stuff that just doesn't feel right. And a court can intervene and say, as a matter of public policy, uh, jury, even though you have said uh, that a duty was owed, I'm saying, as a matter of public policy, uh, the duty was not owed. Now, picking up from our uh, discussion of inherency, uh, this is one of the most important things we'll be talking about, and it is this uh, development with increasing intensity, I'm happy to say, over the last 12 or 15 years, of the primary assumption of risks. The two concepts that we talked about that are at play here are assumption of risks and the adherency of risks. And I, I'm going to ask you to read this. In other words, uh, the encouragement of vigorous and intense participation in certain sports and recreation activities uh, is so important that the simple negligence, not recklessness and not intentionally wrong conduct, that simple negligence is going to be forgiven. We will overlook, we will tolerate, we will even expect inadvertent carelessness uh, in these sports and recreation activities. Now, the Regents case that I just described, in which the two uh, pieces of protection were put in the same rock system, during an instructional course at the University of California, uh, and the fella fell, the court said the mountain moved, which is a little weird, but the court said the mountain moved, in any event, both pieces of protection were released and the guy fell and was either badly hurt or killed, I can't remember. But the, poor, the court said this is an inherent risk and it is assumed of uh, energetic participation in the sport of rock climbing. The same concept is shown up in indoor gym climbing, I would say. The risk is deemed inherent and assumed. There is no liability. Just quickly, uh, let me show you this quote from the Agland Court. I'm just going to ask you to read it. Makes really good sense. And the marvelous thing is how it affirms what we do. All right, next slide, Dan. And importantly, this concept does not extend to all activities. Here are some, I say PAR allowed and then PAR denied. I love the one about the fight in the sports bar. But what you're looking for generally in those that are allowed is something of a communal nature. In other words, people are playing together. Uh, it is something uh, which they are going after energetically. Uh, if you were to intervene and impose a duty of care, it would chill that active participation. Now, I may ask you later on when we uh, get to the Q&A part of this, if uh, you're engaged in certain activities that you're not sure would fall yes or no. And of course, the law varies from state to state. All right, let's look at this scenario. You all have seen it twice already, but you're going to get a quick reminder of it here. A few years ago, the Geology Club from Southern Texas State University, STSU, took a trip to explore the geology of the Colorado Plateau near Moab, Utah. Six students, 
the father of one of the students, and the geology club advisor, who was a geology professor at STSU, drove to Moab and camped at a campsite near the Colorado River in early June. On the first day that the STSU group was in camp, they watched a group of teenagers wade across the river to a sandbar. The teenagers marked the crossing location by placing a stick in the sand. The next day, the college students explored the Moab region and made chili for dinner. While the chili was simmering, several of the STSU students waded about 50 yards across the river to a sandbar. A 22-year-old community college transfer student, Zhang Wei, stayed in camp to write in his journal and keep an eye on the chili while the other students went across the river. At 4.42 p.m., Zhang's journal reads, Wade in the Colorado River. Two students watched as Zhang entered the river, but he wasn't in the place that the teenagers had marked with the stick. So one student, Marcy, tried to get Zhang to go further upstream for a better crossing. When they told Zhang he was not in the right spot, he responded by telling them that he didn't know how to swim. According to the Grand County Sheriff's Report, Zhang was a short distance from the bank when he either lost his footing or stepped into a deep pool and struggled to stay afloat. As soon as Zhang disappeared, Marcy jumped into the river and swam to a point where she thought she would intercept Zhang, but didn't find him. The father, who was on the trip, also jumped into the river and floated for about a mile looking for Zhang. Other students in the group looked for Zhang while Marcy frantically drove a vehicle to a place where she could get cell reception and called 911. Now, uh, based on that, I want you guys to respond uh, to a poll that Dan is going to post. Uh, the first question, uh, was a duty owed to the student by somebody? I mean, by the school, by the parent, by the advisor? Uh, was, was the student owed a duty? You remember the levels of duty that we were investigating? Was any duty owed to the student by anybody? Very interesting. I don't think a duty was owed, um, but let's 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 go through this a little, and we're not going to be able to chat. But uh, this was a 22-year-old guy. He knew he couldn't swim. Uh, is there an issue in there somewhere of his having assumed the risk? One of the most prominent teachings in the law that occurs, because there are a lot of grounding cases, usually involving children. Uh, is that even people of very tender age understand fire, falling, and water. So I think a fair question here is whether or not uh, this 22-year-old man who knew he couldn't swim assumed the risk of wading into the water. The issue of foreseeability, <coughs> if the university is responsible for what happened, what should the university have done that it didn't do? Uh, it had no policies, apparently, that we know about. So uh, it might have, for example, uh, ordered this club uh, or any other club that is going to have an outing to file a trip plan and maybe a risk management plan. But what would a risk management plan have looked like that would have prevented this accident? Uh, would you have to say, don't go near the water? I guess you could say, if you don't know how to swim, don't swim. Um, would you say, don't climb trees? Would you say, have a lifeguard on the trip? So if, if we're going to hold the university to a duty, uh, we have to have in mind something that the university failed to do that a reasonable university would have done. Now, if you're attributing to the university action or inaction taken by the advisor, uh, I just don't think we know enough to know what the role of the advisor was. I'm remembering the a &M case in which really there was uh, an allocation of some authority or responsibility simply because those upper graduates 
uh, asserted themselves and took charge. There's no hint that any of that was happening here. Uh, and then this is complicated by the fact that it was a club, so we simply don't know what the relationship is between the university and the club in terms of control. Causation, uh, again, what did the university not do or what did the advisor not do that uh, caused this drowning? I don't see the other students having asserted themselves in such a way uh, that contributed to the drowning. By the time they saw where he was, they did all they could do and tell him to move a bit, uh, and he just froze, apparently. So I'm impressed that, uh, Lord Dan, what was it, 95% or something, almost everybody, uh, found that the a duty of care was owed by the university. Uh, if you're going to do something like this, obviously, you're going to want to paper it away in anticipation of trying to figure out what can go wrong uh, so that you allocate responsibilities to different people for different tasks. But in the what could go wrong, if you were told that a, that a geology club was going to go out and examine a bunch of rock formations, uh, would you have included drowning? All right, any, any chats, any responses to uh, these comments? Yeah, Red, if you, can, if you can pull up the chat box, uh, you're getting a couple. Well, I got here, the TripAdvisor should have been trained on swift water rescue. Of course, there, you know, there wasn't any indication they were going by a river. I don't, I don't know where they knew that or when they decided it. But I think what we're trying to talk about is stuff they should have planned for and done in advance which means they should have foreseen that this kind of thing could happen. Carrie says, leaving an international student alone in camp near a river, it just would not occur to me that uh, that would be considered a risk. And the fact that he's international, I think they swim, don't they, uh, on the other side of the ocean? Drowning is an inherent risk. Yeah, see, I, I kind of like what Maggie said. Yeah, Drew? We changed our mind. <laughs> I love you, Drew. Well, Francis, uh, university needs to have policies regarding, um, you know, I'd love to talk to you sometime. I bet others were too, about what kind of thing you would design for a situation like this. Um, Jed says he maybe changed his mind too. Can't assume the student would be aware of the risk. I guess I'm overdoing what I read repeatedly. There have been two cases in the last couple of months about drowning. One, Boy Scouts, um, where actually the cubman, the packmaster, was guiding the kid uh, from the bank, and the kid stepped into the water and drowned. But they held that there was no way that the guide guiding the child should have known uh, you know, that there was going to be a pool there. One problem I thought originally, this water looks so much like the Rio Grande in South Texas. Uh, it's absolutely opaque. You can't see a thing uh, underneath the surface. And that might have been a, uh, an enhanced uh, hazard, enlarged the, uh, the inherency of the risk. Hey, Reb, uh, before we get too much deeper into this, I just want to... Uh note that it is it's getting to be after five and some folks may have to leave uh and i think that folks who want to stick around and dig into this kind of stuff can stick in a little little longer for q a so if you want to, to sort of wrap up the presentation and then move to q a for as long yeah as sure and i will say that I, I i am more than happy i enjoy chatting with people so feel free to call me uh anytime you want There's, i've got some contact information at the end of this but uh, just by way of summary, and again, I want to thank Angie and Steve and build on what they had to say uh, in this risk management area. Uh, let's remind ourselves that uh, we're in the risk business. Uh, Angie and Steve have helped us understand how to build a good risk management program and create a culture of risk management. The thing I want to leave you with is that there are are certain aspects of what we do that are appreciated by the law and 
uh, ease our duty of care. That doesn't mean we go out and be careless. It just means that we be, can be confident that uh, the law understands the value of what we do. All right. Um, questions and answers. You want to put out that contact thing, Dan? There you go. So folks who, who do need to take off, uh, know you'll be getting a recording of this, including the Q&A that's about to happen if you need to go. And, uh, and thanks for coming. It's, it's been a really great series. I hope you got to see all three of them. And if not, you can certainly go back and check out the other two. Uh, and for those that are sticking around, Q&A with Reb is a pretty golden opportunity. So let's get into it. And, and Reb, while we're waiting for folks to start typing that stuff in, do you have any, any particular thoughts on what, uh, what kind of questions often come up? Well, people wonder whether their particular activities uh, would be candidates for this primary assumption of risk issue. Mm -hmm. uh, what I've started doing now in drawing participant agreements is trying to even borrow language from some of the cases to emphasize the societal value uh, and the importance of vigorous participation in these activities. Um, so that it can't be said that this is such a benign sort of thing, uh, like sliding down a banister, so that uh, it would not apply. Shed some light on changing laws around the use of epinephrine. You know, I really, I, I'm encouraged, uh, but I get all of this second hand uh, of some of the developments. I think we know there's another product coming out that may be cheaper, but there's no guarantee of that. There are an increasing number of state laws that uh, give you opportunities to have people in full compliance with uh, statutes, and they're proliferating as well, uh, whereby doctors can basically certify somebody as having received enough instruction in this so that that person with this certificate can administer epinephrine. So I think there are more opportunities now to get in the law. Uh, I think people are getting very well trained by WMI and other outfits. I would still urge you to talk to lawyers who are familiar with your program and where you practice that can help you understand if you are you know, with the law or not in what you're doing, because it does vary. And yes, electronic waivers are certainly as good as hand sign ones. There are some dangers of forgery, but there are ways to cure that in the document. But do not hesitate at all to go the e-sign route. Uh, nearly every state has one of these. The federal government has an overriding e-sign law, and it basically says the enforceability of the law is not affected by the fact that it is uh, executed and memorialized electronically. Okay, so uh, Angie has given us a good, a good uh, website for the current state of uh, epinephrine. There was a very good presentation on that at the Risk Managers Conference, and I'll bet that can be reached uh, through that website in the archives. Do you have any examples, Reb, of, of when liability waivers don't hold up? Well, they're not recognized at all in Virginia and in Louisiana. And they're very, very difficult in uh, Oregon and Connecticut and in Vermont, but I think people are exaggerating the difficulties created for us, let's say, by those cases, because all of them have a very strong premises liability component. That is, they come out of uh, cases where the land is owned and controlled by the defendant. Uh, all but one of those cases involved a ski area, and that other case was one of these adventure parks. But uh, the premises liability aspect of it, that is the duty that a landowner owes to a visitor for the condition of the land and what happens on it, and uh, the general availability in those cases of the activity to the public at large. No qualifications, no training necessary. And so the court's reason uh, the visitor could uh, anticipate, could expect reasonably, uh, to be taken care of. 
there's a, 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 I do a lot of work for ACCT, and there is a marked difference in the duty of care owed by those members who run zip lines as opposed to those who run, and that's still happening, these traditional challenge course uh, facilitations. Uh, easy to make a case for the societal value of, um, of the challenge course uh, experience uh, compared to the zip line, which is basically pay for play. It would be very hard, I think, to make a primary assumption of risk defense out of a zip line uh, accident. It'd be relatively easier to make one uh, in a challenge course situation. I don't see any more questions coming in. If anybody's got one, now's the now's the time, or I think we're about to wrap things up. And let me just say again, Reb, it is it is so nice to work with you on this uh, series that we've done, and and uh, have this quality time, you, me, and uh, looks like about forty other folks who are who are on the webinar with us. Uh, thanks so much for what you did today. Thanks so much for what you've been doing. Uh, for the past couple decades in our industry. And it is really nice to have an advocate in uh, who understands the law and also understands what it is we're trying to do here. Well, I'm honored to talk to you guys. Keep doing the good stuff you're doing.